Okay, so today it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the upcoming academic year. Okay, so today's speaker is Mario Harper, PhD student in our department, one of my students, although I've, I kind of lose track. He's working, he's been working now for the last, uh, what, two and a half years at uh, Cisco. Cisco is a robotics lab, uh, which is in the School of Engineering. The director of the robotics, of the robotics lab, Emmanuel, the ex-director, Emmanuel Collins, gave a talk here last spring, I believe. And uh, the current director is Jonathan Clark, and he's here too. So the talk will be, he's, uh, Jonathan's gonna give an introduction, and uh, Mario will then give uh, the rest of the talk. Uh, just to let you know the interest, uh, Jonathan's interest and Mario's in work uh, involves, uh, I think it's called gated robots, right? So it's robots are not simply walking, but they're actually running. And these robots can have anything from a biped to multiple legs, and they even have flying robots you know, in the lab. Okay, so uh, they haven't gotten to the point of self-repairing them. So anytime we ask for a demo, about half of them are non-functional. Okay, so that's a problem. Okay, so uh, it's all yours. You're gonna give a short introduction? I'm, I'm gonna give us a short introduction, and then we'll let Mario do the heavy lifting here. Yeah. All right, uh, so thank you. My name is Jonathan Clark. I'm, like you said, I'm the Department of Mechanical Engineering. I just got appointed as the director of Cisco. So I'm gonna take like two minutes to give you an overview of Cisco. Um, largely because our interactions with Mario have been so fruitful that we want to continue and expand these kinds of interactions. It's been, he's brought a valuable aspect to what we're doing. Cisco stands for the Center of Intelligence Systems Control and Robotics. Uh, I do robotics, Emmanuel did robotics, so by shorthand people refer to it as robotics, but the center really does cover you know, within the umbrella of what we do, anything that has to do with intelligent systems or controls as well as robotics. Although there's a very healthy overlap, which is the space that we exist. Uh, the center was founded in 2003. We're at the College of Engineering, so we're going to both FAMU and FSU. The center belongs to both as well. Um, it's been an integral part in developing the, the robotics and the controls uh, research here. Um, we've done a number of things. Mario's gonna talk a little bit about intelligent systems and locomotion and rough terrain. We'll talk about intelligent planning. We'll talk about robots that run and climb. Those are some things he'll talk about. The center does all these things and more. Uh, some of our specialties include locomotion in difficult environments um, and uh, control of those kinds of systems. We have a variety of faculty in a variety of departments, uh, funding from a lot of places. The reason I'm, the other reason I'm here is to uh, look for potential other graduate students who are interested in working in these kinds of applications. We're looking to take on some new graduate research assistants. So if any of you are finding that this is interesting to you, please come talk to me or to Mario because we're looking for some new students as he's going to be graduating shortly. Um, so, uh, so we do things with motion planning, through rev detection, obstacle avoidance, lifting, carrying. So this is a little sneak peek of some of the stuff that Mario's done, which is legged robots that can run um, with onboard uh, cameras and odometry as he's beginning to learn how to navigate around obstacles. Um, we also do a variety of work. This stuff that I do has to do with bio-inspired uh, motion. So how can we learn from animals? So animals like geckos can climb effortlessly over walls and ceilings. And from that, we can distill mathematical models and express the motion and the underlying dynamics. But now that we can do robots that run and robots uh, that climb, the head to get motion. We just had a new faculty member here that can just be there. We get five people from noise. Uh, often play robots, we may be here as well. That's why it's loud. Um, uh, <laughs> because he's interested in particular in taking on one or two new graduate students, and he's thinking that somebody uh, for scientific computing may be a good fit for the kind of bipedal uh, walking and running research that he does. And so that's it. So now we're going to turn the time over. Uh, tomorrow, any quick questions for me? If not, good. Mario, tell you. Got that. This is just supposed to be introducing what you do now. It's good for us to see how fast Mario talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as much time as possible. Yeah, I have no idea. All right, here we go. Uh, robots. Um, so, a couple of challenges. This is a very important advising staff that I've had on hand. Uh, this is my family. There's the newest one on the, on the, on the part. And if you can't tell, that's the newest one. She's very cute. Oh. Anyway. Um, these, these are my kids. Uh, they, they like what I do. Uh, here's the people I uh, work with. See, you're on there. Um, so, so uh, Emmanuel is, is the second one over there. Uh, he was my advisor for a lot of the time here. Jonathan, thank you for advising me for the last while as well. And Camilo Ordonia is over here, who, who's really our, one of our research scientists who's helped us out with so many projects. <clears throat> now, a couple of students I've had, um, they've been all a lot of fun to work with. I actually have not put a few of them on here because they're somewhat new, but every one of them has been an absolute blast to work with. We've done some very interesting projects together with them. 
And we, we really had a good journey here uh, at Cisco. So kind of telling you what what I do, at least at Cisco, kind of falls into one of three categories. Um, I do show controls work, which is, which is to say, I want to make sure something does something crap properly. Right? I don't know what that system is. It could be a robot. It might not be a robot. Uh, then I, I do mentoring and, and help on some other projects. So this is kind of catch all. If I need to do something, I do that. And it kind of goes in that category. And then, of course, I do robotics. Uh, so there's some interesting publications that comes out of doing stuff like this here and there. And it, it's all fun. It's, it's really fun to do this kind of thing. Uh, so so a quick example over the kind of show controls work I've done. This is a power plant. At least I think I've actually never went inside of a power plant before. But let's say that this is a good power plant diagram. Uh, when you have a utility that's providing um, energy, that's uh, I don't want to say energy, sort of power, how do you optimize your smaller grid over here? So, so you might have like the small grid over here. You want to optimize that to minimize your US dollar cost consumption in terms of operating a facility. So how do you do that given you want to know what the price will be, what, how much solar energy you might be able to get, what can I control for to minimize my actual dollar cost of, of operation? So this is kind of what it looks like. This, this is very briefly going over two, two papers here. But let's say I have a battery I can control. I can have some load, some electrical load that I can control in, in the form of, a, of an AC system. I can twist those knobs on how much I want to turn on the AC, how much I want to charge a battery right now. Based on what I can predict my grid price will be at real time, based on how much I predict my solar irradiance is and, and how much I can get from a uh, solar photovoltaic array on my roof, and given how much I predict my actual desired or required load is going to be on my, on my microgrid cells. So if it's an airport, I, I don't know a lot of these things. I don't know exactly how much power I'm going to require. I can guess. I know how much irradiance I can get, I can guess. And of course, I don't know exactly what the city is going to price, the city utility is going to be priced at. at the moment I demand power. But there's some things I can control for. I, there's some things I can predict for. So what is the best case action to take over a series of time in order to get me my minimum US dollar cost for operation for a facility? So that was a very fun series of papers. Again, not at all really related to my research, but something I got to do, and you can too. <laughs> <laughs> so in robotics, though, uh, there's a series of different robots that, that I've, I've got the chance to play with. Um, I've enjoyed all of them, some more than others, and some are broken, some are not broken. Uh, all the robots have broken at one point in time on this page, several times for most of them. The most egregious was that yellow one in the corner, which broke the motor shaft, and it was gone for a few months. Um, but we've had a lot of fun with these robots. I kind of break them in, in half here. On the left, we've got mobile robots. These are robots that are uh, two, 2D motion robots on a plane. Right? You, can, you can think of this as, I have a flat map. The robot kind of moves on it in this plane. And then there's some interesting research you can do with those. Now, on the right-hand side, we've got these dynamic mobility legged robots. And those, those are quite a bit of fun to play with. Now, I, I've been able to do a couple little pieces of research with a lot of these robots, but um, the green ones in green are in progress right now. They have been toned down. There's a lot less green papers in progress than there were before. So I am actually paying attention to people, to do what people are telling me. <clears throat> so when it comes to robotics, uh, there, there's IEEE generally breaks down conferences in one of four categories. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the categories in robotics are generally speaking focused on intelligence, which is how the robot makes decisions, mobility, how the robot moves, right, and perception, how it perceives and, and understands the world, and of course, how does it interact with the human. That one's the one we've probably done the least in, and for good reason, because that, that's kind of hokey. Not, not entirely, but, but it's important, but it is a lighter shade of blue than everything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the interesting things about robotics, though, is you kind of have this big gambit uh, of all sorts of things you can do with it, right? Uh, you can imagine to me, uh, and this is an example that was posed to me a few weeks ago, is someone says, clear the table, right? You, you have this command. You now have to process it from a natural language perspective to understand what, what do you want me to do, right? That's intelligence. 
So now I need to understand what was the command, why did you, what do you want me to actually do? I need perception to see, okay, what do you mean by table, define table, what do you mean by clear, what's on the table that needs to be cleared. The intelligence needs to queue and say what needs to be cleared first, what goes where, and then eventually mobility commands have to be issued to say move my end effector to some point, grab something, if I can grab it, grab force control and I move it in a logical fashion. Right, so in just a very simple sentence to do something, you have a, well, in my mind, like you have like three or four papers, but but uh, <laughs> but you have all of these things that you have to be worried about, right? You, you can't just focus on one thing than another. And what I want to talk about today is going to be a smattering of intelligence and mobility. And the reason I, I say this is what I want to talk about today is motion planning. So motion planning is, is actually just what it sounds like. How can I plan my motion? Uh, if you are a, and, and I'll kind of tell you more about it in a second, but you can you can see this robot. Here we go. Uh, this this is one of the early stages of the Minotaur gate. The gains are very high, and there it goes as it turns, and it's able to turn. This was one of the very early turning experiments that we had. Incidentally, that's you right there. But this is kind of hard to predict. Uh, this kind of motion is is actually very hard to predict because it's moving very quickly. It's doing a lot of things under the hood, and we can't analytically say in real time what exactly the body velocity is going to do. So given that, it's really hard to tell the robot to go from point A to point B when you don't actually know how it moves. <coughs> it's true. Now, other kinds of planning, and just, just, to, just to touch on this, so, so this, is, this is manipulator planning up here. Very precise. Incredibly precise plot. <laughs> and yes, Kuka, Kuka does that because Kuka's, Kuka is, is they're German and they, they, do, they do what they want. They make great videos. Uh, but that's kind of, it's hard, but it's, it's different, right? And you have a fixed position your robot is always going to be at, and you're always moving an end effector, you, and, and Kuka robots have very, very good encoders. Very precise. Another kind of robot, this is the Amazon robot. These are mobile robots, but they have, a, they have some nice things going for them. You can see, uh, actually, if, if, if you take a look here, on the, on the ground there, there's little, little tags that tell the robot where they are, and it can ID itself on a grid. You can do that here because the robot is clearly in a warehouse. So the warehouse is interesting. What the robots are doing are, are different, and it's very interesting in terms of a planning problem. Trying to motion plan for, I, th I think, somewhere around 6,000 robots at a time is actually very difficult, it turns out. I think I haven't done that before, but let me, let me back off my statement. I just said it, it's probably difficult. <laughs> uh, but what we're more concerned with is, is down here when we're trying to navigate unstructured environment. We don't know what the robot's going to do, and we don't know what the terrain is like, and we don't know how it's going to interact with the terrain. And, right, and at that point, you, you have some more complexity. So why are we? Why am I interested in legacy platforms? Um, we have them. They're interesting, but there, there's more to it, right? Uh, legged systems like you and I have a fairly diverse range of motion. Uh, we can do things. Now, a lot of a lot of these situations here, you can see that, right? Uh, if you have a certain obstacle, you might not be able to clear it with a wheel or a um, track platform. But there comes a point where you know you have a sufficiently large tractor wheel platform, it will clear obstacles, right? But what we can show is a legged robot is very versatile at a small size. You don't need a bulldozer to get around rubble. You can walk over it. <clears throat> so another interesting thing about legged robots and, and this and the and the cheetah is really in, in, impressive. You, you can see how it turns. And you can see this because oh, they're doing all sorts of interesting behaviors. Um, wheeled robots, they, they can't do that. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> With sufficient propulsion, they could probably do something like it, but, but it sounds expensive. <laughs> so there's like oh robots behind you. But... No. So all of these different kinds of scenarios, right? Uh, like climbing stairs, if you, again, if you have a sufficiently large track or wheelbase, you might be able to do that. Highly uh, undulating terrains, wheeled robots, 
you tend to start to lose odometry when you have high undulation. Can't really say that, I mean, but like a robot. Uh, force perturbation, that's an interesting one, uh, that may, uh, I mean, I'm glad to go back to that one, so interesting. When you give it a force, right, it can correct for it. And it can, it can maintain attitude and, and correct for it. Kind of, kind of interesting. So we need to put all of this together and making, making this like, like a robot work. Now, running has its own set of problems. By problems, I mean interesting research questions to solve. So you can see this on the cheetah here. Uh, when you're running, you have this nice little flight phase where you have a ballistic motion problem right there. And then you have a landing. Uh, you can imagine the forces on the vehicle are somewhat significant. And you can see this is a this is a T2. Right. And you have high degree of time on force generated in different parts of, of the robot. And it's kind of hard to predict that. Particularly if you're trying to do like interesting maneuvers uh, as you have to go in left and right and turning. So look at the state of the art. Uh, in, in this state of the art, we, we have uh, a breadth of literature in planning. So there's actually quite a bit of literature about uh, I, I have some set obstacles or I'm trying to do some very slow quasi-static motion. I'm stepping slowly, stepping on top of obstacles some stairs. There was a great paper on stair climbing that, that was all about how do I maintain stability, move my center of mass up the next step, and go on and climb the stair, right? But, so great paper is all motion planning, but they're not... They're not fast, right? They're all about how can I maintain body stability as I go? And I mean, that, that's, that's all fine and good, but since other people have done that, we're not so interested in that. I mean, it is interesting. Don't get, don't get me wrong. Right. I didn't make fun of like, this year. Uh, but but what, what, what's more interesting is saying a human, when we're walking, right? I mean, I'm kind of falling forward as I walk. I'm not necessarily stable right now as I'm moving on. Mentally stable, I think. But the, the point is, is we can do better, right? We can go faster and still be able to do some interesting maneuvers. But can we motion plan for that, right? So, so up on the top, we have gates, right? And on the bottom, we have delivered in motion. Now, you can see animals in nature also have different kinds of motion. If you're walking on very unstructured surfaces, you don't want to be moving very fast. But there are certain situations where you actually do want to move fast. And that's what we're interested in. So let, let me move forward to the state of the art. So here we have some autonomous autonomous motion. This is IHMC, which is just down in uh, just just over in Pensacola. And you can see there's some very very good foothold planning problems, right? Great stability controllers, um, excellent foothold selection, and it does fairly well. And then you have a little more uh, slow, but still a, still an impressive foothold planning problem. So both of these. Are quasi static. They're always stable. It shifts forward is still stable. And again, we can do better than this. Uh, now, uh, 2017, here's Anymal. Anymal is gate based. Uh, well, kind of, uh, not really. You know, it's still quasi static. I don't know. You can ask your local like a robotics expert whether or not this is gate based. <laughs> Get his email after this. Uh, but th this is kind of the state of the art, right? Uh, it's got great correction. It's not fast yet, but it's it's a good robot, and ETH is very good at what they do. And then, of course, the the elephant in the room. Uh, I got a quick question. Yes. Does quasi static essentially mean that at any given time you have three feet on the ground? At any given time, if I stop, I'm stable. Which means you got three feet on the ground. Not necessarily. You can do it one foot on the ground. I can stand on one foot for a yeah. little bit. Oh, okay. But if I'm in the middle of the flight phase of running and I freeze, then I fall on my face. So that, but I'm still stable when I'm running, but I'm not quasi static stable. If you have point feet, yes. Well, point feet, three feet. Well, exactly. And then you need three. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, so this is the elephant in the room uh, in all the legged robotics. This is VDI. Um, if you've seen <coughs> these videos, um, they like to show off.
I can't other than only see the good things, right? So. This has a blank page. You can see that, right? Then there's a clear blank page on this page. Uh, they are able to run it. And a lot of this is, is just good control. And of course, this one, this is the more interesting one to me. Because I see this map in this corner, and this map is fascinating. So this is a series of waypoints that's following, generated, it looks like from RRT, based on looking through, trying to comb through the website to figure out how the heck they did any of this, since they don't publish anything. Uh, this is the spot mini. It's, it does a reasonably good job. Again, this is the actual speed, so it's moving reasonably, it's moving relatively slow still. But it looks like it's able to do some interesting planning problems. Um, yes? It looked like it already had that map ahead of time. Was it it, doing it looks like it, it, it's probably given an a priori map and then told to follow waypoints after a series of, they probably made waypoints to follow and then told it to track waypoints. So it's more of a control problem, I think, than it was an actual planning problem. Saying control to this, to this line, follow this. I'm not going to show you climbing the stairs because it makes me feel sad inside. <laughs> so what we can do though is, is we we have our algorithm S3PO, and, and those who have heard about it, and those on my committee, I'm so sorry. Uh, but we, we have an algorithm that we've used for both planning and control. So so the same algorithm that I'm going, I'm going to show you in detail has been used to solve the energy problem. So uh, we, we've done it for energy control, we've done it for flow control, uh, we, we've looked at it in terms of using it in financial applications. Um, that, that's more on the side. We're not going to talk about that. But we, we've been able to use this algorithm on a nice little wheeled robot, the Husky, when it was working. It is working now. Battery scan. It's working. But, but it's actually able to plan to the goal, and, it's, and it does it reasonably well. In fact, the, when the Army came out for assessment, they were actually rather impressed with it. it performs better than the old planner that came default on the robot, which was actually a nice feather in our cap for us to, for them to compliment us on what, what we were doing. So what, what actually is this and what does it do? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so path planning is, is kind of where, where it comes from. So path, path planning's job is to say, I have something in output space. I want to go from point A to point B, do a graph search, and connect the points in such a way that I can just follow a line to get to my goal. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of, of classical algorithms, right? So the old algorithms, like this is the greedy search. It says always pick a point that's going to be the closest to my goal. Now, there are very well-known cases where greedy does badly. And, and in this case, you can see that. Uh, we only explored all the yellow regions are the explored regions, we explored very few regions, but down here, we explore a ton of regions, and the path it finds is very suboptimal uh, in terms of distance. It's going to go meander around quite a bit. That's the, uh, that's the greedy path that, that, that converges to. Over here in Dijkstra, the Dijkstra algorithm is not efficient, but it's guaranteed to always find the optimal path. Dijkstra searches radially outwards from your initial point. So what we want to do is we want to actually use an A star algorithm, which uh, I'm going to talk about more later. But we are different from a path finding algorithm. We do we don't do uh, path search or we don't do path finding. What we do is trajectory generation for motion planning. Yes, there's a difference. Oh, I've had this conversation with certain people, but yes, the, the difference is <laughs> the difference is. We actually look in the control space. So everything we do, and we are the center for control system control as well, is we do everything in what can I control for to get what I want, right? So that means I can, instead of looking at points in XY space to get a map connecting me to a gold position XY, what I can do is say, okay, Mario, I want to go to point X final, Y final. But I want to look only at what my legs can do, propagate that through a model to get my body velocities and positions over time, and that should take me to the goal. I don't want to look at x, y space. I want to just look at my control space. So this is what this does. And what we start with is we sample control inputs. So, so for one of our robots, it might be frequency of our leg movement. 
how fast our legs are moving and how much uh, turn command we give it. And I'm not going to go into what actually went into those turn commands. But that goes into view. Uh, we also send the current state. So wherever the robot is, I found that zero, zero, I send it out. We are zero, zero now, and I told you to do something. I told you to execute some command. What actually happens is I have a prediction model that turns that command input into my output space. And it says, OK, you execute that command. I predict that you are now at position x, y, y, i. And I, and I predict that the cost it's going to take you to go to that position is a certain cost, whether it's in distance, time, uh, US dollars, whatever that cost function is. And I have a heuristic that says, I predict that from that point to the goal, it's going to cost you an additional certain amount. This is then optimized to an LPA star algorithm, which, which I will talk about a little more later. So the, the sampling based component of it says, I, I pick my use. And I generate this tree. So this is a graph search algorithm. A star is a graph search algorithm under the hood. And the way I populate this tree is I, I just propagate forward the tree and I branch <coughs> off based on all my new children that I've sampled. So every child I've sampled is a series of new control inputs. And I propagate that until I find a goal. Yes? What's u, x, and y? What are the x? Yes. Um, where, where's the x? Wasn't that last oh, sorry, k. Okay, yeah. Last slide? X one. Yeah, X I'm defining as my states. So state state in, in this would be what I'm actually interested in. So that in this case, it would be X, Y position. X, Y, theta, because I want orientation to the robot, too. Um, and so I'm realistic that I want to make it the goal. That's my X. So I, I have a desired X that I need, but all I really look at is U to get to that X, which is, which is what I can control. Because I can't directly control my position space. I can't control my, what my robot does. And so I, I make a tree of different U's, which leads to different X's. So, so these dots are actually in X. So these, these dots are in, in but the U's may not, But the U might not necessarily lead to a precise, I mean, your graph is composed of discrete values of X, right? Like a regular A star yes. algorithm, right? And so given U could not necessarily land you on one of those discrete X's. It may no. land you between X's. It can. And so what, you're minimizing the discrepancy between yeah, so, so usually when I define a goal region, I define it as that a region that I can feasibly be in. So that's if what's y? So x are the coordinates in the space, u are the internal coordinates of the robot. What's y? Yeah, y. That could be u. Yeah, I guess I should have made sure all of my slides were consistent. Is that a u in reality? No, uh, x. this is. <laughs> In control literature, why is the output? Yeah. So if I if I output that, that can be my y. So this is in, this is y space. I should I should keep them consistent. I said x earlier. This is y. Okay. I don't understand the graph. Yeah. Like I don't understand what's y one, what's y two. So y is a vector. Y could be. What's the, what's inside the parentheses and what's yeah. the why could be so so why could be anything and, and I'll, let me let me try to clarify that the k is my time step or my discretized step and the k so in blue this is the k plus one given k so I, I know I what I take position k which is a position in y space here in this graph and that position. Uh, leads to, to the green, if I expand those out with, with new robot inputs, it leads me to green, which is given a y of k plus 2 given k. Is that fair? It's not, but you, you, you have something else in your mind. But. Right. <laughs> now, the model, the, the model I use could be any number of things. I, I favor the neural network because neural networks are convenient. It could be a simulation. So if you have the luxury of simulating in time, which we should be done in terms of power systems, uh, turns out power grids, your 15 minutes is actually OK for control time. So you have 15 minutes of time to propagate out your model. That actually means that you can run a full simulation. Uh, it could be a very quick input-output model, where you're literally evaluating a function that you have an analytical answer to. Uh, and there might be others. Those are the three I've used, but I haven't told there are others. Wait a minute. Now, a simulation, you've got a set of governing equations. Yes. 
In a known network, the known network can be supervised and supervised, and you've got a whole ring. Okay. So, what kind of known network is it? I'm glad you asked. It's the on the slide. Right, so. Thank you for being here. Now, uh, the, the model predictive element of it, so we, there are different cost functions that we do have to evaluate with. Uh, in terms of robot planning, uh, we've got minimum distance. That's a very common one. That's what I was doing all this morning. Is trying to say, I, I have some robot at some point. I want to get it to some goals in the most distance efficient manner possible. Which is to say, that's different from, you know, I want to save time, I want to save energy. This one's actually a bit tricky because you have to understand power models of the robot and how it corresponds to motion. And then minimum deviation. This is the MPC cost function, if, if you're familiar with MPC literature. It says, given I have some reference, which is something I desire, minimize the error from my output to what I desire. And that's, that's, that's the MPC cost function. I, I, I like that last one a lot because it, it's a nice catch-all for saying, I really want the robot to follow this particular trajectory, minimize the error of that trajectory, and then it will, it will do that. So, so usually I end up starting a plan for the robot on the first one, which is minimum distance or minimum energy, and then I say correct for deviations using this last cost function. Yeah, but I mean, is that happening before your robot's, okay, look, you want to go from mm -hmm. point A to point B. Between right. those, you may have 20 different steps, let's right. say. Are you doing all these calculations while you're still at point A? Or are these calculations occurring while the robot is on its way to point B? <coughs> and it, depends on the robot. <laughs> it depends on the robot okay. and the computational power on board the robot, as well as the perception stuff. Okay. So sometimes we do it real time. Mm -hmm. It's a great paper I have on parallelizing this, this algorithm, so it can be done in real time. I think you're on it. <laughs> that's fine. It doesn't, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I understand all the details. Oh, no, no, that's fine. There's no application whatsoever. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so, so the A star algorithm which we use, and this is part of the LPA star, uh, it takes the greedy search. And for, for those of you who are familiar with the A star algorithm, I apologize. This is, this is, I'm sure, boring. But the greedy search in yellow and the Dijkstra search, you can actually put them together and weight them in such a way that you, take, you move towards the goal, but you still guarantee optimality. So your search region becomes much smaller. It's, it's still no better than a greedy algorithm. The, the best you can do is a greedy algorithm. But it's much, much better than Dijkstra in almost all cases. And th this is a classically hard case. This is a trap problem. Um, everyone in motion planning knows this problem. Uh, it, it is an annoying problem. Uh, this, is, this is the canonical problem in motion planning. And the best you can do in search is, is this region right here. But by combining it, you can say, I know that my cost to get to my goal is whatever cost I've incurred to get from point A to some middle point B, plus an additional cost I expect to get from that interior point to the goal. And that's how it, that, that is how A star works. I'm pretty sure I confuse people. I apologize for that. I'm going to keep going. So the heuristic function actually matters quite a bit, and it changes based on the robot. Uh, up on top, you have a big track vehicle, the, and the heuristic functions are the one of the secret things about our algorithm in making sure that it actually converges in a timely fashion. What it means is, if I know my robot is facing some point, right? If I'm facing you, I want to go to that door. How much distance do I compute for my robot to go from here to there? Well, that depends. Can my robot turn in place? Because then I can calculate the Euclidean distance. Some robots can turn in place. Climbing robots cannot turn in place. So the distance computation get from here to there is actually about eight times that of, of what it takes for me to, to just turn and go. So, and these, every cost function, heuristic function, has to be well engineered and understood based on the properties of the robot, which is part of the research. It's very interesting, but it's also painful. Another way to define the heuristic function is we can actually change the way we, we sample. Um, this, is the, this is the easy way to, to get computational speed up. Uh, you can see that this is an RRT algorithm, which we've actually um, inherited a lot of our uh, inspiration from. If you bias your search towards a certain region, and you're always sampling in such a way that it's kind of biasing you towards, towards some, some output region x, y, 
then you will converge faster than if you if you just randomly sample it. And I think this is true. It's a different than Markov chain and Markov and MC MC methods. So we can actually use both. We, we can have a nice uh, analytical heuristic based on the physical dynamic properties of the robot, or we can and we can combine that with a nice um, sampling based heuristic that, that biases us toward, in our sampling towards what we are interested in. Uh, finally, the optimization, it uses an LP A star optimizer. Uh, if you're familiar with A star literature, this is lifelong planning A star. It's convenient for replanning purposes. That means if I generate this graph and I've optimized in the graph, if I wanted to, I can keep that graph orphan some nodes, graft it back into a new tree, and still um, save on computation time. It, it's a very interesting algorithm. If you have time to read it, I think it's a fun paper. It's a Lekashev's it's a paper, so it's like 60 pages long, but it is a good paper. Uh, one of the reasons we can use LPA star, though, is, uh, let me back up. A star is a great algorithm. We don't grade, we have a tree. The reason we can get away with that is because we have this implicit grid that whenever two nodes are sufficiently close to each other in output space, we actually merge them and decide which one is the victor. So given these two paths, we, we one took two control inputs to get to some point x, y, and then another one took one control input to get to point x, y. We decide which one was the most cost-effective way to get there. Whichever one won, wins, stays in the tree. Whichever one doesn't, is pruned from the tree. Yes? So does that mean that when you have given a new problem, you have some new objective? Yes. That means you get some heuristic that pops out. It means the first step after that is then to populate this grid and then yes. pair it down. So yes. that has to do any time you change your objective. Yes, if I change my objective, I could keep the node <coughs> if, it, if, if I needed to. So, so there are some aspects of the node I can keep. Like if it's a completely different problem, a completely different robot, I, you shouldn't keep any of this. But if it's the same inputs, and you just said, I'm going to point like x, y over here, but then I stopped and said, I, I had an invalidation of my path, right? like some obstacle came or someone walked in front of my sensors. I can't go there anymore, replan. I can keep the valid parts of my tree still and branch off of what, I existing, what, what my existing tree is. All right, so, so but, but, but this grid base is fundamentally heuristic dependent and therefore objective dependent. That's yes. Sure. Thank you. From the heuristic methods. Does anyone else get excited when they see this slide? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't know equations. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I. Whenever I see it, uh, yeah. <clears throat> you may you may have noticed that I favor certain things more than others. Um, one, one interesting thing, though, about uh, SBMPO is if you want to make it a control algorithm, in other words, you want to make sure that it controls you to do something, right? I want to minimize my deviation from my trajectory. I can plan a certain number of time steps ahead. Even though I can't plan all the way to my goal, right? If I'm, if I'm planning out like 40, 50 meters, my sensors can only see 20 meters, I can't realistically plan to my goal. It doesn't make any sense. So I only plan out to my effective sensor range and at every step, I replan a new path as far as I can go, and eventually I will converge to the to the final path. So, so you can, this can be used as a control algorithm instead of just an optimization algorithm. They are very similar. There are some numerical tests you can execute. Um, no, I'd be excited about this. Yes, yeah, so, so some numerical tests that you can execute about. Uh, the, the efficacy of SMEPO. Uh, you can compare it to some other existing uh, MPC functions. So, so what we saw was a restringence function. It's, it's a convenient one to test with, but what we're going to test is saying, can we find the minimum of the function? Uh, because it has a bunch of local minimum. You can start off the search at any arbitrary point. We're going to compare it to the SQP, which is, I think, is a pretty standard in MPC literature. Um, so this is a quadratic programming approach. If we compare the two algorithms, uh, SP, uh, so the quadratic programming only converges within the, the lowest well. So any of those dark asterisks you start in, if you initialize the algorithm there, it will converge to the to global minimum. SPMPO actually will converge to the global minimum irrespective of where you go. It is a global optimizer. What about the time to convergence? In other words, in other words, your 
the one on the right, mm -hmm. you converge from every point. But yes. if you but if you want to put the amount of time it takes to converge to within some error to, to the global point, you might. Yeah, and it, it conceivably like, goes yeah. up exponentially as you go towards the right. I mean, yes. maybe it, and you don't know no. because you don't know. No, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, not really, but I, I'm, <laughs> you, you point out something interesting because SPMPO is it is an A star algorithm. At the end of the day, it is, A star is under the hood. And A star is only a star, and I think those in the video game literature know this, because A star is a very common kind of a, a sprite manipulation and, and automatic planning algorithm. A star is only good if your heuristic is good. So if your heuristic uh, in distance is easy, including distance is usually a pretty good heuristic. Um, if I know that I'm going to cost a certain distance to get there, I will converge very quickly, because the algorithm is going to bias itself to search along regions that have that same cost. But if I'm planning from here to that back door, there is a big obstacle field in my way. Euclidean distance is actually not that great of a heuristic at this point, so I've actually spent a lot more time searching than I perhaps should. But if I know something about my problem space and say, my heuristic needs to be Euclidean distance times two, I will probably find the solution very quickly. So in this case, we had a zero heuristic which means we have no heuristic, it's just, a, it's just a Dijkstra search. And it wasn't as fast as SQP. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but if we biased the search because we knew the goal was at zero, zero, then it, it converged almost instantaneously. Okay, so when you run your algorithms in a classical yes. situation, you have cases where your heuristic can actually change as a function of timing. In other words, as your robot is moving and the terrain changes, I can imagine if it sees a rock all of a sudden, it would change either the heuristic continuously we choose from a finite collection of heuristics. Mm. Do you look at these kind of things? Uh, no, but it's a good paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Talking about the lookup table of heuristics, that would be Well, that's obviously the simpler method. But I mean, the more cool method, I'm not suggesting I've got an answer, right? Is to, have a, is to have a neural network which analyzes the image and basically outputs a set of parameters to the heuristic, which would be parameterized by some complex function. And so the heuristic could actually change continuously according to the environment. And then you get a robot which is more adaptable. I mean, this is in my mind. That doesn't mean anything about implementation, but I can imagine that. Yeah, one, one of the most interesting problems in robotics recently, uh, and when, when Max, when Max and Lukashev came by, you, you mentioned this, but you have a robot that's holding a mirror. You want to get this robot through a doorway and put the mirror on top of a table. So what it has to do is it has a mobile planning problem. It has a manipulation problem. And it can't fit through the door if the mirror is on a side. So it has to figure out that it has to move the mirror up, navigate from the side, go around the narrow hallway, go into the room again, and then put it down and set it down on the table. Right? And it turns out um, you really need more than one heuristic. Because you can't just say, you know, planning problem x, y2, you know, y2. Right? You can't do that. And he made a new algorithm called MHA star, which is a multi-heuristic A star. And I think that would benefit greatly from what you just said. Um, yeah, another paper. Great paper idea. Success. Well, then. Uh, anyway, there's some neural network stuff. You can use that too. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll be really fast. Neural networks are, are particularly helpful because you can sometimes analytically determine what you need. So the robot's going to do something. You don't know exactly what it's going to do. What, what you can do is you can put in a motion capture field. You can give it some commands and then see, OK, it, it did this. I gave it this command, it executed this, and it did this kind of strange motion. At least I was able to characterize it. And then this is a prime example where you know, the neural network is really convenient, because you don't, I don't know fundamentally what it's doing. I think I do, but then it doesn't do that. So the neural network then learns what my control inputs are, and what my actual body velocities, and my power consumption what my perhaps time it took to actually to, to do something was. Yeah. And everything I need in terms of real state information for the robot in, in the real XY space, I can get out of a neural network. And I found that the recurrent neural networks are better because this is a time series system. Uh, I suppose I could use a convolutional network where we pass in a vector of time series as well, but the recurrence has worked really well for us. <clears throat> so we, we've tried recurrencies where we explicitly feed back outputs as an input. We've tried it where it's actually at real RNN. <coughs> we've used LSTMs. LSTMs have worked incredibly well. There are some issues getting them online in training, but 
again, there, there, there are many things that we've run up against. Most recently, we've, we've had issues with the Jensen TX2, which is NVIDIA embedded systems chip. But more on that when, when you come back to me. I'm going to just go through the result. This is a cool robot. So here's ours. Oh, it's not working. So this is, this is a very slow motion. In the XRL, you'll notice it can't turn the legs. So unlike uh, wheel robots or cars, which I can change an axle and change the heading, heading angle, the robot has to introduce an asymmetry, if you will, in, in the way that its right and left sides behave in order to get turning behavior. But that's, that's one of the reasons why it's really hard to mathematically understand what the robot's going to do, because they're essentially forking one side more than the other. Is that, I don't know if that's fair to say that. This is fundamental physics, I'd say, that has to be the case. So. Okay, thank you. So we, we, we've taken the network, uh, we, were, we were able to take some raw data, filter it, predict some, predict some outputs. We tried different kinds of, of network inputs and outputs, whether or not we're passing in previous term commands, whether or not we're passing previous time steps velocity. And we can, we can see the fits changed over time. We, we actually were able to get very good fits for our motion model with simple networks on XRL. XRL, it's important that they're simple because the robot's brain was so small that we had very little computation on that robot. But this network can run. The second network can run was really good because this one had very little um, uh, evaluation time and ran just fine. It had a good enough fit that we were happy. Uh, a couple other robots here. This is Llama. Llama's bad. It didn't play. It, it's impressive. Llama is incredibly impressive. It can stand up like me. It's also like 10 kilograms overweight. But happy to. That's the one that is being developed uh, with, with JPL. Uh, we, we were able to help with some, some of the little things here and there. We're, we're trying to write a motion planner for this robot. Uh, we were able to characterize in simulation different kinds of turning behavior. So on the left, we have graphs showing a different frequency of the gate, so how, how quickly the leg is moving, what the corresponding xy positions are, that the turn angles, and in simulation it looks really nice. We got some nice speed, velocity, power curves. You say I, I anticipate if I have a high angular velocity, I, I expect to use more power. I think everyone expects that. The harder I turn, the faster I turn, I would use more power. So there's a couple of interesting things that we've learned from simulation. We've trained neural networks on this. And these, and these neural networks have been fairly accurate. Uh, they're not as accurate as I would have liked them to be, but they did pretty well in the noisy data. And I'll show you why it's noisy here. Or, or not, maybe not. Right, we're, we're predicting velocity, power, angular velocity. We give it some canonical cases, a narrow gap problem, wall gap problems. These, these are fairly canonical motion planning cases. And we can, sh we can see different kinds of planning modalities that we, we've tested in the simulation. This is distance-based planning versus um, power-efficient planning. That's right. In a distance planning case, we, we actually run into some obstacles, uh, which, which is actually really interesting. But anyway, here's the video of it actually working. You can kind of see why we, why we have some issues. Uh, there's a bit of a balance to these vehicles. Even in simulation where, you know, uh, in, a, in an ideal world, we shouldn't have a lot of rolling motion. We actually see that there's quite a bit. This is a big robot. Some of our little robots, uh, the bouncing is quite bad. Okay, hold on. Yeah. I'm, I apologize. No, I mean, this is finished before going to the next slide. Go back to the, right there. What does computational time mean? I mean what computational, computational time, time is. Like? is uh, computational time on board the computer that we're using on the robot. So this is an actual... I know, but obviously the trajectory that you showed, assuming it was real time, took more than 0.1 seconds. Yes. So we're we talking about computation per step? No, computation for the whole trajectory. So the whole trajectory in red that you see here... So this is a case where it was computed before we started? Yes. Okay. That was not obvious. Yeah, sorry about that. So yeah, everything in red that you see there is computed in 0.1 seconds. Okay. But we're not replanning. We're not replanning, but we are correcting. So we, we do have the correction that we are trying very hard to implement right now. 
it'll get there. Are you correcting when you're off trajectory to get yeah. back on trajectory? Yeah, so we, we do have that trajectory control, which is an MPC uh, controlling. So what's needed before we can do real-time refining like that? On Tails or on Llama? Llama. On Llama, all we would need is the full state information, which Sasir says we have. So long as we have odometry, we're okay. Speed-wise, not a problem. Speed-wise, not a problem. The llama is really slow. <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to get it up to that, that speed. Uh, speaking of faster robots, though, so this one is the early, early Minotaur. When he was when he started. Right here. Eventually, he got optimized to this faster and faster gate. And, and, and one of the reasons we really like the Minotaur is it's got direct drive motors, no no gearbox. I mean, you don't sacrifice your speed for, for torque. And that means that we can do some interesting locomotion. We can get very fast with it. Uh, unfortunately, it also means, uh, let, let me tell you what it means in a second. Uh, so what, one thing that we were able to do, we took the Minotaur, we, we, we had the nice improved gates, we were getting it to go very fast, we put uh, computers on it, we put extra batteries, we have perception on it, better power system, and then we tried to run it with all of this together. So here it is running on grass, and then here it is running on asphalt. Uh, it turns out terrain actually matters quite a bit when you're running, and we knew this. <clears throat> so one of the parts that uh, I'm doing right now is trying to characterize this terrain effect. So in other words, in both cases, the, the path was identical because... The path was identical, but it did something different. Yeah, yeah, because... Yeah. Because, because as, as you expect, I mean, the terrain is very different. And it, we, we, whenever we run, I mean, running on sand is very different than running on asphalt. Are, we, are you learning dynamics on uh, on the using dynamics from the learn uh, model from uh, model? There, yes, from, from we learned something on lab terrain, right? Lab tile from experimental data. From experimental data, okay. and then we applied it outside, and it didn't quite work. So we we applied a correction factor. Really not. So when we apply a correction factor, are you gonna quit? We apply the correction factor, we can actually you know, do things pretty well. It's not perfect, but in, in simple in simple cases, and we're, we're just trying to get out a little bit farther than nice. But in, in new terrains, it actually is able to perform fairly well. The reason it's jittering is the gain is really high. It's trying to correct the motor very, very accurately. It's trying to keep it to a certain position, so it's also in back and forth. But in both cases, it's, it's actually able to correct the terrain factors reasonably well. That's the paper we just submitted. We will correct that paper as we go on and add more, add more things to it. All right, uh, so in, in a nutshell, one of the big things that we wanted to show is we actually can motion plan for running like a robot. Ooh, not anyone, you know, no one else has said this yet, right? So we were we the first one to say, we're motion planning for a running legged robot, not just a regular legged robot. We, we're running, we have interesting things going on, and we're motion planning at high speeds. At least that's, that's one of the big things that we want to say. Now, everything else, there's a lot of things that can that, that happen. Uh, please talk to us, and we would be happy to tell you more about what we do. So if you could, uh, thank you to all the people who helped us. Uh, if you have any questions, um, Last word here, Mario. Do you want to do a description? Oh, sorry. Um, so, so we're going to, unless you ask, we're, already, we're about to run over time, but I want to take one minute and let Christian introduce himself. He's a new faculty, he just joined our department uh, three weeks ago. He's working on uh, bipedal walking and running of robots. Uh, he's in particular looking for new graduate students, so if any of you guys are looking for research opportunities, he's going to take two minutes and talk about five minutes. Uh, yeah. Talk about the cool stuff that he's doing, and then we'll open up for individual questions afterwards. So. Thank you for your patience and let us take two more minutes of your time.
And yeah, don't worry. It, it, it won't be long. It's just videos. I know people love an extra presentation after one just ran. Um, so at <laughs> least one more. Yeah. Ah, there we go. There we go. And if F5 is still the button here. So I can see this is my legged robot. <laughs> so yeah, so hi. Um, just real, yeah, so, so real quick, my name is... Uh, you don't button. Like button. Yeah. So my name, my name is Christian Kubicki. Um, let me go back here. Uh, I do bipedal robotics and, and beyond. Uh, I'm a new faculty here at, uh, at the College of Engineering and Mechanical Engineering Department. Um, and my work has to do with kind of all sorts of venues of legged robotics. So uh, I typically like to highlight sort of four components of my research. One is, you know, this bipedal walking robot like here, that right here that we use, that we control called Duris. We do some analysis of running ostriches, which, which were fun experiments to be a part of. Uh, jumping on weird terrain, something that Mario has dealt with, and this kind of interesting looking robot called Atreus, which we actually got running outside. Um, but uh, it's interesting to, to you to kind of the scientific community department here is uh, a lot of this a lot of this sort of controls uh, controls work is very algorithm algorithm based. This is a large scale uh, nonlinear program uh, we're solving via a large scale interior point algorithm uh, called IPOPT. Probably have heard of it. And the whole point is that uh, a lot of our algorithms will actually optimize the walking motion for this robot, you know, joint by joint, and that's what will give us our our walking motions for our machines. Here's a uh, you know. Video of our robot walking from heel to toe, which is actually, you know, we talked about quasi static like a locomotion. I like to feel a dynamic like a locomotion, which has some interesting algorithmic implications. And if you're curious on uh, how you get robot shoes to go to this size of a, a robot toy, like you would any other um, So, you know, th this guy was a consummate professional by the way, and uh, robot shoe size. Um, uh, furthermore, there's lots of work in terms of actual practice. I like to do in my lab. Uh, this is how we sort of manually tune our robot to games, just like a Mario, like the student conduct his game. This was a, a fun experiment with my, that I did as a graduate student that I completely did not tell my advisor about. Um, um, yeah, so we kind of just helped the robot with dodgeballs and uh, um, eventually managed to take down the robot as I'll show in a second. Uh, you know, I'm like wondering how what happened there. Well, turns out you can hit the emergency side. <laughs> <laughs> so, my point is. So yeah. So uh, so moving forward. So I, I'm a new faculty here, and we're and uh, we you know those robots were all custom built. Uh, but I actually just purchased a brand new uh, Cassie robot, basically it's an ostrich-like robot, which is kind, which is which is which could be faster, more maneuverable. It's built tougher, and it's kind of this ostrich-like robot, and uh, it's going to have a lot of interesting computational implications, which is why I would love to show you scientific computing folks. Uh, that's uh, um, in case people are interested in this sort of project. And if you are, please get in touch with me via my website or my email right there. So thank you so much for the extra few minutes. Questions? Well, yeah, yeah, sorry. No problem. I mean, come on, robots are ultra cool. <laughs> but I have a silly question. I have a silly answer. So they are kind of, uh, uh, there are these ultra marathons, you know, where people run over mountains, you know, for 100 miles and so on. When will a robot be able to do that? You know, these are kind of I mean, yeah. this would be all this terrain issue, you know, because uh -huh. to me, these robots look just like a toddler is doing better. Well, and and, uh, and somehow, you know, that every time I open a Wired magazine or kind of look at some, some news about robots on TV, then I have to fear for my life because they think, A, my job, you know, and <laughs> take anything else. And if I look at this, you know, which I, I have the impression it's cutting and research. It will take another while. It's so you're safe. You so, not safe, but you're safe. Yeah. <laughs> so one, it was a funny conversation. I was at an MIT a few weeks ago, and uh, one of the guys I was talking with over lunch, he said we had we had a Google X like preview, and all these big executives came by to see our robots, right, at C cell, and they're for their capstone demonstration. They had an Atlas robot walk up the stairs without a harness, which which is terrifying. That's an expensive robot, and it opened the door for for the and then let the let the people up the door, right? And one of the executives looked and said, "My four year old can do that, <laughs> right?" And 
In one hand, yeah, sure. Uh, four year olds, yeah, I have one of those. Uh, on the other hand, we got we have a mechanical four year old we can make now. Isn't that cool? Because <laughs> uh, you know, four year olds have this great proprioceptive stack. We've got like sensors everywhere. They've got great like adaptability. They've got great intelligence. Uh, and it, it's almost flattering to say like you know, a four year old. Mm -hmm. We can almost replicate the capacity of a four year old to a degree. But in terms of going over a mountain, uh, yeah, well, uh, I think you're safe for a little while. And to be clear, the four, you know, four-year-olds we're happy to do. We're very concerned about robotic terrible twos. To be quite honest, <laughs> um, so you know, we haven't wrote that subject yet. So. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add that for that four-year-old, it took him like millions of years to evolve, to be able to do that. So I think we're in good shape. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So how much of work has there been with uh, trying to motion plan and create motions and? and not like for a drone, like not or? just working, not just working with like, like say you have a robot who's holding a. I think you've given a similar example. Say you have you have a robot who's at the <coughs> waiting tables, for example. How much um, has there been any? Has there been a lot of work in trying to figure out how how to get a legged robot to walk, like from the kitchen to a table and then uh, serve customers or something? So this is that, the like, mobile You're talking about mobile manipulation. Yeah. That is, generally speaking, a 15 to 17 dimensional problem. Uh, well, well yes, I, I meant we, three we visual did. dimensions. Like, I, I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. you can transform that into... Yeah, so, so usually yeah, you yeah, have like seven degrees of freedom, two arms, yeah. plus an x, y motion, plus heading angle theta. Then it gets annoying. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but in, to answer your question, yes. Um, the first project I actually did in the lab was actually on a space vehicle, which was a six-dimensional problem, because you're worried about X, Y, Z space and your velocity, because you're trying to get to some point with a known velocity, right? In space, you don't want to hit a target with high velocity. So you have to hit a target with zero velocity. And that was an interesting project, because you do have to worry about not just pose, which is X, Y, theta. You have to worry about a lot more stuff. Oh, sorry, did you have something to say? Let's see if that was a good question. Oh, planning, yeah, planning is different too. Can you give some context on like the size of the compute power on board each robot versus, you know, like a like Raspberry Pi at the lowest end versus like a laptop? And what, what's what's on board? nice to some of the robots. The, the robots. <laughs> like are there, are they, um, there's not a lot of storage involved with it, just basically it's let, Yeah, let me kind of walk you it. through the three or four basic computers we've we considered. Uh, on the high end of the scale, but on like the Roman, we have four Gigabit Bricks computers, which has the i7 6700 HQ processors. Um, and those ones are running 16 gigabytes of RAM a piece. We have four of those. And then we have one uh, next gen. It's called next gen. It's a, it's a, and that one's running a 6520U, I think. Um, Stepping down from there, the Husky is running a couple of TX2s and a Mac Mini, and then an Intel. And then we have stepping down from there, we have an Intel Nuke, which runs the at least it's running the seventh generation until i7. <laughs> and then we step into the small robot scale, which is uh, the Compute Stick, Intel Compute Stick has an M5 processor, two gigabytes of RAM. Uh, we have one version with four gigabytes of RAM, and the story digresses from here. Uh, at that point, the worst we have, I think, in terms of real computer is a Intel NUC that that has a small Pentium. So everything is on board on the board. robot to do the job it needs to do. Is there any kind of comparison of I don't know about HVS doing, and those things. Yeah. I mean, is there is there a remote aspect to this where like you know a larger compute can solve bigger problems that talks back to the robot, or is that a different kind of uh, I guess then that's how the scope of what you're trying to work with these robots. Are these supposed to be autonomous robots without any connection to anything else? Um, Army frowns on having tethered connections. What about what about flying drones which have onboard computers to actually communicate wirelessly with you? I think they have worse robot. battery life than our, our robots. <laughs> Say that again? I think their battery life is worse than our robots. But, um, we, had, we do have drones too. We, we bought drones. Uh, Tails. Tails. Well, battery life. I mean, how long just thinking right. around? 
this one? I don't know how long chassis can run. Chassis? Well, that, that's not fully tested yet. That, that, by the way, that, that entire little black chassis in the middle, that is contained by like, basically a giant battery. Um, we could probably get, um, I would guess, about an hour or two out of that, out of that battery. Yeah, that's right pretty there. good. Like, which, which, in, which in light robotics is, is quite good, but that's my other guess. And what you mentioned, by the way, is, is my gut feeling, this is only from a control standpoint, where I'm trying to keep the robot from falling down most of the time, our heuristic is that if the, if the answer is we need a bigger computer, we can sort of say we're probably approaching the problem wrong. But for something like a like a drone or something, some kind of drone army or something like that, I could I could see that in that sort of context. It's not something that I'm aware of being thought of in the context of legged robotics yeah. as having some super brain elsewhere. Yeah, now now we have one robot right now, it's called Tails. It's a climbing robot. Climbing is even worse than legged in terms of payload. Is that fair? <laughs> Every, every ounce is going to impact not just the, 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 the dynamics, but like whether or not it can even climb. So that one is actually all done off-board. So all computation is done off-board, sensing is done off-board. All that it has on-board is a small chip, a TNC that accepts commands. And then it has very little logic on-board to, to keep, the, keep the, dynamic, the natural dynamics of the robot. Uh, probably you already know this, but uh, when you're dealing with three-dimensional stuff, motion, uh, rotation, it's better to work with quaternions. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, I mean, I didn't see this, but this actually helps you to reduce uh, the number of variables, and it might give you a more. Yeah, yeah, the compression through quaternions is absolutely important, and that's why we rely a lot on ROS, because the ROS has the automatic quaternion commands, and it can take our point clouds and put them into the quaternion space, which is, which is super helpful. But you are right. Have you done that before? Um, in a different, yeah, something like that, in other words. Make sure you leave your name. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Okay, um, so you were talking before about trying to about trying to do, a, I think early in your presentation, about trying to do motion planning on um, undulating surfaces. I'm not responsible for anything 15 minutes or earlier. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> okay, but I, I, I remember that being part of your presentation. So okay. at what point, so how do you do, and uh, computationally, computationally speaking, if you have an image from a uh, from from a camera sensor on, a, on one of these on one of these robots, and you're trying to figure out, and you're trying to figure out what is where how to how to plan within that undulating motion, do you do these robots have the kind of computing power it would take in order to in order to figure out the angle of incline within that <laughs> undulating motion to classify this is an obstacle, this is not an obstacle, I can cross this or I can't cross that. What the the dirty trick that, that is employed, and I actually asked the same question because uh, Cecilia was wondering what angle to move the Velodyne LiDAR at on the on the llama. When I was at a JPL, he, he was just thinking like, what is the optimal angle to put the Vel the LiDAR system? And whatever the angle is determines what the cutoff point um. is, and everything below a certain cutoff point is considered to be not there anymore. Uh, it actually does have some problem when you have like a something come up close to the robot because it's at that angle and then it assumes there's actually no obstacle anymore. Uh, so you do have to keep that in mind. But yeah, they're, 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 we use LiDAR to just cut things off instead of trying to do image processing because image processing is expensive. Would the uh, robots have the computing power necessary to do some, to do some sort of simple image processing? The Xavier chip should help. If you if you're familiar with the Xaviers, it came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, Nvidia's newest embedded system deep learning chip. It's supposed to be the same watt as twenty watts, but better than TX2 because TX2 was not a sixty-four bit architecture, which is causing us grief. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask the last yeah. question. Okay. So, can you say a couple words on the courses that Emmanuel had you take when you joined Cisco? <laughs> I mean, if anybody interested, it'd be good to have an idea. Yeah, anything taught by Jonathan Clark you should take. <laughs> um, they're fun courses. Well, uh, so we have intro robotics, biorobotic locomotion, legged locomotion. Those are probably the two that are most relevant. Then what the controls got? Controls. I'm the new controls guy. It appears so. <laughs> so those are the core that you would need. And they're mostly math, or they combination of math and computer. Uh, fundamentals, math, little computer application on my side, computer-based projects and things. I tend to like to have project components in my courses so people change your research. 
And in Jonathan's classes, I think I've had one paper that's coming out hopefully in ICRA, and then another paper a while back on motion plane that I that's come out of his course project. So he put. I'm sure they'll both push you, but in a good way. Like you lovingly pressed off of a cliff, and you'll, you'll learn to swim. Okay, the point is, is opportunity. Okay, so you should at the very least talk to these guys. Right? So you all have Mario's mail, or at least you all have my mail. So if you want to communicate with these guys, you can't access them directly, you can access them through me. Okay, any more questions? That's it? Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Sure, sure.